Thank you, uh, Jeff. Thank you all for uh, uh, coming out today. I'm thrilled that there are this many people interested in uh, mid-century opera, and it's a thrill to be back. Uh, my third time in this series. We're conspiring about possibilities for next year, so uh, stay tuned. Um, and uh, I'm really thrilled to be talking about this topic, which was the idea of the uh, board of the uh, Palm Springs Opera Guild uh, in connection with mid-century uh, uh, well, with mo Modernism Week, as it's called here in, in Palm Springs. And uh, I have no creds at all in the field of architecture or design, so I'm not going into any of that at all, but I'm going to be talking today about um, opera that sort of coincides with mid-century, and I'm, I'm defining it very broadly from the 1930s to the 1970s. We're looking at the whole middle <laughs> of the century in a, in a grand scheme of things. And uh, if I miss out your favorite piece or your favorite composer, I apologize. We uh, have to stop, hard stop at 3 o'clock because there's a, another event happening. But um, I will stop today at about 2.30, but halfway through uh, to take up some of your questions. So think of any question you might have for me. Uh, the first question I always get is, what's a dramaturg? So I'll tell you that now, which is, uh, in my case, scholar in residence. I come from the musicology side, the music side of the business. Dramaturgs in Europe tend to be from the theatrical side, and they're often involved in uh, developing stage concepts, uh, reinterpretations of ideas. Uh, I'm not involved in that. I come from the music side, but I have worked with a lot of composers on uh, developing new operas uh, from a dramatic, structural, musical uh, point of view. So that's, uh, in a nutshell, what I've been doing as a dramaturg. Uh, in my full-time work at San Francisco Opera, I was also involved in hardcore uh, uh, bureaucrat bureaucratic things like scheduling and budgeting and orchestras and choruses, dancers, music staff, publishers, libraries, all that. We're going to talk about opera today, and uh, I'm uh, so uh, admiring of this style of the mid-century that you're so familiar with in Palm Springs, um, not only in uh, architecture but also in uh, design. And uh, these are just some of the images that came to mind as we think about mid-century. So many wonderful images, styles, and uh, creations. But uh, uh, we also think of the culture that was involved. I'm a child born in the late 40s, grew up in the 50s, so this is very much my <laughs> formative years. I'm sure it is for many of you. What about mid-century opera? Uh, well, when this is mentioned, I think the reaction for a lot of people is, oh my God, it's going to be so <laughs> ugly and harsh and dissonant, I don't want to listen. Uh, the fact is that I hope today will demonstrate um, 20th century opera has a lot to recommend itself, and it has uh, won uh, quite a following amongst American audiences and actually international ones. Uh, European models were what American composers followed uh, in the early days of our country up um, to the early part of the 20th century. And uh, when we think of that, we have to realize what uh, American composers were looking at uh, for their models. From the 1930s, Alban Berg, for example, who's a pioneer of what we call serial technique or 12-tone uh, uh, writing. Here is the end of his opera, Lulu, uh, where Lulu has fallen on hard times. She's this uh, wonderfully attractive woman who is the, has ruined many men uh, who have fallen for her charms. Now she has fallen into prostitution, and one of her uh, clients turns out to be Jack the Ripper. And uh, this is the very end of the opera uh, as he kills her while um, the woman who loves her, Countess Geschwitz, looks on. So this is uh, an example of European modernism at the uh, early part of the century, and if we jump ahead several decades, um, this is European modernism uh, in the 70s. Uh, Arabi Raimann, German composer, his opera based on uh, Shakespeare's Lear, and here's the 
final portion of that with uh, Lear and the wife of his, uh, the, the body, I should say, the body of his daughter Cordelia. <laughs> So many American composers did follow in the footsteps of this European sound world ideal, but many did not, and the ones who did not are the ones I'm going to focus on today. Uh, by the early 1930s, American opera composers were beginning to have a new idea of what American opera should sound like. Perhaps it should be different from European models. And I would say that American composers were often highly criticized for striking out in different directions uh, from what was thought of as the adventurism and modernism of the European composers at the time. And the whole idea of what American opera should be about came to be an important question, particularly later in the century, where tr typically American uh, topics really became the things that focused uh, the attention of the composers. We start with George Gershwin and Porgy and Bess from 1935. This to me is the beginning of uh, modern opera in the mid-century of, uh, of our country. Uh, highly um, uh, criticized nowadays by people who are very conscious of cultural uh, appropriation. What was this uh, Jewish white guy from New York doing trying to write about the experience of African Americans in Charleston. Well, I'm not going to go into that whole topic. That's something for a whole weekend seminar. Uh, but he wrote a masterpiece. And uh, I like to quote Leonard Bernstein on this topic. His uh, book, The Joy of Music, has a chapter in it called, Why Don't You Run Upstairs and Write a Nice Gershwin Tune? <laughs> and here's a little excerpt from this. It's an imaginary conversation with Leonard Bernstein having lunch at the English Grill at Radio City with a professional manager talking about Gershwin. He says, do you remember Bess's scene with crown on the island? Bess is saying, it's like this crown, Oz the only woman Porgy ever had. And the professional manager joins in and they sing the whole rest of the scene and the restaurant's all eyes and ears at this point. And uh, the manager says, I think we're making a scene. And Bernstein says, but that's just what I mean, thrilling stuff, isn't it? Doesn't it point the way to the kind of Gershwin music that would have reached its own perfection eventually? I can never get over the horrid fact of his death for that reason. He died at 38 of a brain tumor. With Porgy, you suddenly realize that Gershwin was a great, great theater composer. What he would have done in a the theater in another 10 or 20 years. And then he would still have been a young man. What a loss. Will American, uh, America ever realize what a loss it was? Uh, here's the uh, scene that he was talking about. Bess is now in a loving relationship with the disabled Porgy. Uh, because it is hard for him to get around, he stays behind but urges her to go with the other citizens of Catfish Row to a church picnic on Kittawa Island. After the picnic, she's about to return to the boat with the others when she is intercepted by her violent former boyfriend, Crown, who is hiding out on the island after killing a man, and he insists on getting Bess back. So let's watch this scene. I reckon it'll be just a couple of weeks now I comes for you Soon I got something to tell you What that? Ever had 
Bess is sui generis, it's one of a kind, no one has come anything anywhere close to uh, duplicating this kind of thing. But it did show other composers that there are new ways, there are new directions, we don't have to follow European models. And I'm going to explore some other examples. Going into the 1940s, uh, Giancarlo Minotti, who uh, um, of course was born in Italy, but essentially American composer, he considered himself an American composer. Uh, here's a little bit of his uh, opera, The Telephone. Uh, which is all about a, a, a man who's uh, about to leave on a business trip and he wants to propose to his uh, girlfriend before he leaves, but she's constantly on the telephone. He, of course, does eventually propose to her, and you can imagine how. He uh, goes to a telephone booth and calls her up. All right, here is a much more serious piece uh, which won the Pulitzer Prize, uh, The Consul from 1950. 
the, uh, the Cold War era. Magda's husband, a freedom fighter, has fled persecution and left the country. Magda waits endlessly in desperation at the consul's office in a vain attempt to obtain a visa to join him. Here we have the first part of this. Sign here. I said sign here. very fashionable in intellectual and critical circles to put down Minotti, uh, but I'm not among those people. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, it's hard to see the buttons on my computer here. I'm going to move it forward a little bit. Ah, that's better. Now I can see what I'm doing. All right, here's Leonard Bernstein's Trouble in Tahiti from 1952. So the opera focuses uh, in on the domestic conflict of Sam and Dinah, a young couple who, far from the perfect picture of a suburban life that was the ideal in the 1950s, are desperately unhappy. Sam is a successful businessman, and Dinah is a frustrated housewife. She tries to forget her troubles by taking in a matinee of what turns out to be a terrible movie about the tropics, and that's the opera's title. The opera really has nothing to do with Tahiti. Uh, in his big scene, the competitive and overconfident Sam boasts about his prowess at the office and at the gym. His theory is that some men are inherently superior to others. There are natural-born winners and looters, and he is definitely in the former group. Uh, I think this is a very well-put-together opera. You probably know about, uh, of course, uh, um, West Side Story, and uh, many of you, I'm sure, uh, know about Candide. But I, this is a piece that uh, I'd like to focus on this afternoon. I've got three different uh, men singing this aria. Here's the first part, They Never Will Win. Oh, 
there's a law, there's a law about men. There are men who can make it and men who cannot. There are fish who go swimming and fish who wind up in the pot. the books to judgment day and examine the techniques of winners galore there are men who will practice the rules religiously every day they'll improve just a tiny bit more and they'll put all their soul behind it all their ego power drive and will and desire behind it and they'll throw themselves in they never will win, they never will win, they never, 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 never will win. Here's the middle of the aria, sung by another baritone. There's a love, there's a love about man. There are men who are flabby and men who are thin. There are fish who are fattish and fish who are trim in the fish. Born a winner. This is a Dutch singer, but his diction is probably the best of the three here. The winner, the winner is born a winner. He never will have to worry about his dinner. He never will have to think about getting thinner. Cause he's a winner, a nature boy, a hero, a hero in a story, a story with a wonderful story. Whatever they touch will tend to go it, and that every decision will always be right. There are men who can handle the work of seven men, I still manage to sleep seven hours a night. You can throw all your weight against them, all your fire, snow, and hail, and tiger's disaster against them. They'll be strong with our queen. For they always will win, they always will win, they always, 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 always win. Ready for his close-up there. So Bernstein, like many other composers, Gershwin included, uh, were not afraid to incorporate American pop idioms uh, into their operatic scores. Here is Aaron Copland, The Tender Land. Uh, not a successful opera uh, in many people's estimation, but I think it is uh, a wonderful uh, illustration of Copland-esque writing in the area of opera. It was originally uh, meant to be performed on TV, uh, but uh, that's not how it actually got its premiere. Uh, it's about a uh, Midwest farm family. A couple of drifters come along and are hired on as farm hands, and there's a love story that goes badly. Anyway, here is the famous uh, ensemble, The Promise of Living. I might mention, uh, this is from Berkeley Opera. The singing is not top-notch here, I'd have to say, but uh, it's wonderful Copeland. <laughs>
You may recall how uh, Bernstein's Candide ends with the ensemble uh, Make Our Garden Grow, cut from the same bolt of cloth here. All right, let's move on to Carlisle Floyd, who is still with us. He's 94 now, um, writing opera still. Uh, Susanna from 1955 is his uh, probably best known piece based on the story of Susanna and the elders uh, from the book of Daniel. I say Catholic Bible because it's not in the Protestant Bible. It was one of those stories that was added to the Bible when it was translated from Hebrew into Greek. and We don't have time to get into all that, but the story of the, these two lusty elders uh, spy on Susanna while she's bathing and then they try to force her to have sex with them. This is a, a modern day interpretation, of, once again, uh, with political implications. Uh, this is the middle of the McCarthy era. Here is the famous aria from Susanna. <laughs> been mercilessly criticized for his tunefulness and for his lack of adventurism. Um, but I think that's unfair. Here's the great scene from the opera. Reverend Blitch, who ultimately is Susanna's downfall, hypocrite that he is, preaches a fire and brimstone sermon. That's a scene from San Francisco's production. Here is the great Sam Raimi singing this sermon. I'm fixing to tell you about a feller I knowed what was young and smart and rich, except he never put much thought on his whole or soul of where he'd spend eternity. One time when I was preaching in Texas, I was called to his home one night, and there he lay all sweating with his eyes all staring. Come to be heard. Be heard, be heard. 
Sam. I grew up in the uh, Norwegian Lutheran tradition. We never had sermons like that. <laughs> All right, uh, let me uh, take a quick pause here and see if there are any questions that I might uh, tackle. Um, not necessarily about what I've covered so far, but uh, I always say there are no stupid questions about opera. There might be a stupid answer or <laughs> two, which I'll try to avoid. I see a hand there. Thank you. I was, I was fortunate to attend the premiere of Bernstein's Trouble in Tahiti plus A Quiet Place in 1984 in, uh, at the Kennedy Center in Washington and actually have a signed poster from the maestro for that. Could you comment on A Quiet Place, how it might have evolved or differed from uh, Trouble in Tahiti? Okay, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with this, uh, A Quiet Place is a, sort of a sequel, if you will, to Trouble in Tahiti, and um, it's about the Dine and Sam's family later, and their son, who turns out to be gay, and so forth, and it's still dysfunctional. And um, the entirety of, of Trouble in Tahiti, which is a one-act opera, is incorporated into A Quiet Place as a kind of a flashback. And uh, I think um, many uh, analysts would say that it, it doesn't, um, it doesn't work as well as Trouble in Tahiti does by itself. That that's, would be my estimation, although it's still a, a valuable co contribution to the repertoire. Is there another one? Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about Samuel Ramey? I'm not familiar with him. I can't believe it, but what a magnificent wow. voice. Can you tell us about Well, Sam's retired now. I think a uh, great, great guy from Kansas, very, uh, very, um, shy, unbelievably. Uh, he's a big presence on stage, and he's thrilled us in San Francisco many times. One of, uh, one of the uh, last century's great, great artists. Yeah, it's just thrilling. <laughs> it's pretty hard to uh, sleep through that. Wow. Yeah, uh, but I, think, I, I don't think Sam is singing anymore. Uh, the last thing he did for us in San Francisco was uh, Verdi's Atelier. He sang that title role many times, but he came back as the, the brief uh, cameo role for the Pope. <laughs> so that was kind of a, uh, a career-ending uh, role for him. Yes? Can you describe the influence of Kurt Weill and Dvorak on these composers that you've excerpted so far? Wow. Um, well, starting with Dvorak, of course, who uh, was a Czech composer, uh, but highly influenced by his time in America, and you probably know his New World Symphony, which incorporates Native American tunes in it, and there's his famous American String Quartet, which uh, does similar things. Um, so, um, really, the, I'd say the influence is the other way around. I think American composers have influenced Dvorak more than vice versa. I could, could be wrong about that in the case of certain composers. And then with uh, Kurt Weill, of course, was a German composer who fled the Nazis and spent uh, a lot of time in Hollywood, uh, famous for Three Penny Opera and uh, things like that. Um, so Weill's music is, um, is this unusual mixture of kind of European, there's sort of a decadence, European decadence about it, uh, with, uh, with American sort of optimism. It's, a, it's an odd uh, sort of combination there. And uh, his pieces, I don't, it's hard to qualify them as, Euro, as uh, American in a way, um, although um, mostly in English. Uh, and uh, I would say he occupies this sort of kind of middle ground between a European and American and just in terms of genre. Maybe one more, and then we'll press on. We'll keep going then, because I've got lots more to tell you. Um, let's get back into it here with more of these mid-century guys. The Ballad of Bibi Doe by Douglas Moore is another one of these fits uh, into this category of uh, successful pieces that were highly criticized for their lack of adventurism. This is about a, uh, a guy who makes a fortune in the uh, silver mines and uh, divorces his wife and marries this young uh, baby Doe and they have a wonderful um, life together despite hardships, and then he, he's ruined uh, with the passage of the, uh, uh, the, the uh, gold standard, and um, uh, uh, she uh, sort of rescues him at the end as he's dying. Here is uh, Beverly Sill singing the famous Willow song. <laughs>
did this piece in 2000, and the Chronicle critic, uh, Josh Cosman, who I admire, uh, said this, Baby Doe is one of a crop of mid-century American operas, others include Carlyle's Foil Susanna, which we just heard, and Robert Ward's Crucible and Jack Beeson's Lizzie Borden, which are coming up, uh, that were once thought to promise the flowering of a new American opera tradition. They boast distinctively American subjects and undemanding scores whose folk strains and lyrical songs give them an, an enduring popularity. But many of these operas have not worn well in spite of their revisionist claims of their admirers. Well, they've not worn well in the opinion of many critics, but uh, I think with the public is a different story. Samuel Barber, uh, with a letter, uh, uh, Vanessa is his most famous opera with a libretto by his partner, his life partner, Giancarlo Minotti. Um, Vanessa has been waiting 20 years for her lover Anatole to return. Her young niece Erica voices her melancholy as another winter is upon them and they are still waiting. We hear this often in audition, this aria. Another opera that's been dealt uh, harshly well with by the critics, uh, Andrew Porter, a famous uh, writer for the New York Times, writes, it's a weak syrup apparently brewed from Chilea, who's the composer of Adriana Lecouvreur, Giordano, the composer of Andrea Chenier, Tchaikovsky, and Richard Strauss. Well, whether you think it's a weak syrup or not, a weak syrup or not, I would say, it's a worthwhile piece. Go on to Robert Ward, uh, who won the Pulitzer Prize for his opera, The Crucible, uh, in 1961. We'll watch this scene. Abigail was once a servant in the household of John and Elizabeth Proctor and had a brief affair with John before Elizabeth fired her out of suspicion. Abigail is now the leader of a group of girls hysterically accusing women of witchcraft, among them John's wife Elizabeth, who is now jailed. And in this scene, the crafty Abigail tries to persuade John to become her lover once again. <laughs> based on Arthur Miller's uh, play, of course, uh, about the Salem witch trials. A pretty good piece. And here's another one that was condemned by that critical remark I read earlier. Jack Beeson's Lizzie Borden um, from uh, 1965. 
you know the story, the accused of uh, axe murders, but she was uh, acquitted. In this scene, Lizzie, who mourns her dead mother, is oppressed by her wealthy, domineering father, Andrew Borden, and her hostile stepmother, Abby. The sea captain, Jason, asks permission to marry Liz's younger sister, Margaret, but Andrew Borden accuses him of being interested only in his daughter's money and mockingly offers his troublesome older daughter, Lizzie, instead. Lizzie's mind begins to unravel, and this is the mad scene that ends Act One. opera be without mad scenes? <laughs> and uh, interestingly, it's not always the women. Uh, that's a good trivia question. How many mad scenes can you name uh, where it's the man? Um, we'll, we'll play that game sometime. <laughs> All right, so let's get on into the 1970s where American opera begins to enter uh, quite a new era. Um, the uh, mid-century style is beginning to yield to new sounds and new ways of presenting drama sometimes kind of leaving out the drama. The uh, chief expert on that would be Philip Glass with Einstein on the beach. Uh, one of his knee plays, don't ask me to describe what that means. Philip uh, famously said, don't, please don't ask me to explain what this is about. I don't want you to think about what it's about, <laughs> whether it's about Einstein or the beach or anything like that. Uh, this is uh, an example of what um, is called minimalism, although it's not a term that either um, Philip or other practitioners of the style like to use, but uh, really reducing down to simple harmonies and uh, uh, very little counterpoint, that is, interweaving of, of, of vocal lines. It's really all about rhythm. And uh, an even more striking piece is uh, Satyagraha, uh, which is uh, ostensibly about Mohandas Gandhi and his struggle for uh, uh, rights for, um, for Indians working in South Africa on the railroads. And again, um, it, it's uh, sung in Sanskrit. Uh, we did it at San Francisco Opera, I think it was 1988. Um, and uh, it's kind of useless to sort of sort out what it's about. Uh, what the text is uh, has very little to do with what um, we are actually watching, uh, scenic-wise, but it's uh, fascinating anyway.
So uh, this is the kind of the beginning of the end of uh, modernism and uh, mid-century modernism, I should say, and uh, the beginning of a new style of American opera that is thriving still. And uh, it uh, sort of got connected with an idea that was launched in the 1980s, which was sort of mockingly called CNN opera, um, which is opera that, that's based on contemporary events. Um, and the first to fit into this category, and there, there have been many, many more since, but the first to fit in this category was uh, by uh, Peter Sellers and John Adams with the uh, librettist Alice Goodman, uh, Nixon in China, which premiered in uh, Houston in 1987 and has become uh, very frequently done now. Other operas uh, that fit in this category by John uh, include, of course, The Death of Klinghoffer, which is the, about a, the story of a uh, hijacking uh, by Palestinian terrorists of an American, uh, an Italian cruise ship, rather, but an American named uh, Leon Klinghoffer, who a Jewish man in a wheelchair was murdered and thrown overboard. True story. Um, uh, John also went on to write an opera about uh, Robert Oppenheimer and the invention of the atomic bomb called Dr. Atomic. Uh, so this is one of many operas that have been uh, sort of inspired by the headlines. Uh, this, of course, is about the momentous meeting of uh, Richard Nixon when he was president with Mao Zedong in China in 1972. I was uh, a Navy officer stationed in Naples at the time in Italy after my Vietnam stint, and I remember it was the biggest headline I've ever seen in a newspaper that tall. It said, Nixon andra a China. <laughs> Nixon's going to China. We were just gobsmacked by this idea. Now everybody goes to China. Well, maybe not right now, but uh, <laughs> you, I'm sure many of you have done so. Here is a little bit of uh, Nixon in China. <laughs> Nixon in China, in my view, we've launched into a whole new era uh, of exciting American opera that uh, we're still in the midst of, and uh, I would say we might even think of it as a golden age of American opera. These are some of the composers that are active now, many of whom I've worked with. Uh, Jake Heggie's uh, famous operas are Dead Man Walking, Moby Dick, Three Decembers, and It's a Wonderful Life, Ricky Eden Gordon, very successful The Groups of Wrath, Jennifer Higdon, Cold Mountain, which was originally a commission for San Francisco opera, but that kind of fell apart, and it was premiered instead in Santa Fe and Philadelphia. I just, Jennifer just got a uh, Grammy uh, for her harp concerto. I just uh, got a response back to my congratulations, and she's uh, busy working on a revision of Cold Mountain. Bright Shang, a Chinese-American composer who teaches at the University of uh, Michigan in Ann Arbor. Madame Mao and Dream of the Red Chamber are two of his big pieces. Mason Bates, The Revolution of Steve Jobs, will be uh, done in San Francisco this June. It's already been done in a couple of other, three other places, actually. Uh, Stuart Wallace's Harvey Milk, that'll happen in San Francisco. It, it was premiered in the early 90s, but a uh, revised version happening in San Francisco uh, in a few weeks. And The Bonesetter's Daughter is this big piece uh, based on a novel by Amy Tan. Kevin puts his opera Silent Night, which is about uh, this Christmas truce uh, during uh, World War II. Uh, where everybody put down their weapons and um, went out, out of the trenches and um, had a little moment of peace together. And Laura Kaminsky's As One is one of the most frequently performed operas now, which explores um, 
the whole Arab gender um, dysphoria, if you will, or uh, uh, what we call it uh, transgender. Um, Tobias Pickers, Emmeline, and the fantastic Mr. Fox and Doris Claiborne are all fairly well-known operas. Uh, Tobias just won a Grammy for Fantastic Mr. Fox, and uh, he tells me he is working on a, uh, a new piece for, uh, he is a music director at uh, uh, Fort Worth Opera, I believe it is. Uh, Missy Mazzoli's Breaking the Waves has uh, made quite uh, a splash. Andre Previn's gone now, but I had a great uh, time working with him on his opera, Streetcar Named Desire, which is, uh, I think, one of the great American classics. Marco Damo's Little Women is very frequently performed, uh, and his uh, opera, The Gospel of Mary Magdalene, is uh, quite a fascinating piece. Terence Blanchard's Champion uh, is a great um, story about a, uh, a uh, black boxer who was also gay, a true story, who um, was uh, really devastated by the fact that uh, a guy that he was fighting uh, died. He, uh, he managed to accidentally kill a guy he was fighting in the ring. And he has a piece coming up for the Met called Fire Shut Up in My Bones. You probably know about The Ghost of Versailles by John Carliano, which was uh, is sort of a, a extrapolation of the whole idea of, um, of Mozart and uh, what's going on in Versailles. Uh, with uh, Marie Antoinette and various others. Matthew O'Coin's uh, Eurydice is uh, the take on the famous story of Orpheus, um, seen from the eyes of the woman this time, and that's, I think, uh, performing. I know it's uh, about to premiere, or already has, at the LA Opera. Have any of you seen it yet? Right now it's premiering. Uh, Tanya Leon's The Scourge of Hyacinths is well known, and she's got a, a premiere coming up called Little Rock Nine. Just a tremendous amount of fascinating activity going on, and I wish I had time to talk about it, but maybe I'll come back and talk about that some other time. Uh, great to talk to you. Thanks for uh, listening, and uh, we'll keep on going. <laughs>